Romans chapter 10. Romans 10, I'm going to begin with verse number 13. How many of you have been blessed the last couple of weeks by the things that are going on during the week? Anybody feel like you're growing? Anybody feel like you're engaging? Praise God. Romans 10 and 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And that's not the plan of salvation right there. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent as it is written how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. Anybody here tonight thankful that at some point in your life somebody brought some glad tidings of some good things? The Amplified Bible, verse number 14, says it this way, But how are people to call upon him whom they have not believed? Upon him whom they have not believed, in him, in whom they have no faith, on whom they have no reliance. And how are they to believe in him, adhere to, trust in, and rely upon him of whom they have not heard? And how are they to hear without a preacher? And then the Message Bible says, verse 14 and 15, this way, How can people call for help if they don't know who to trust? How can they know who to trust if they haven't heard of the one who can be trusted? And how can they hear if nobody tells them? And how is anyone going to tell them unless someone is sent to do it? That's why Scripture exclaims, A sight to take your breath away. Grand processions of people telling all the good things of God. Again, our focus this week of Engage is His purpose. His purpose. Father, thank you once again for your sweet presence that we have felt in this place tonight. You have responded to our worship. You have manifested your spirit in this place tonight, and we thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for what you're doing in this season that we are in right now, God. Thank you not only for what you're doing in this season, but what it's going to mean for the days and weeks and months that are to come. I pray tonight, Father, that you would continue the work that you were already doing. I pray, God, that you would cause us tonight to to afresh and anew engage ourselves in your purpose, God, in your heartbeat, in your desires. I pray, Lord, that your spirit would speak in this place tonight, that you would give us ears to hear what you would say. Give us hearts that are open to receive your word tonight. Father, I trust in you tonight and depend upon you for your anointing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. How shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And since some of you are probably sitting there right now going, well, that doesn't have anything to do with me because I'm not a preacher. Let me read to you the Greek word for preacher here. Because it's not about an office. It's not really in this context about a calling per se. The word preacher in the Greek here means to be a herald. To officiate as herald, to proclaim after the manner 
of a herald. According to Thayer's, the word preacher here means to publish, to proclaim openly something which has been done. Specifically, it's used of the public proclamation of the gospel and matters pertaining to it. According to Webster's, a herald is an official crier or messenger. It's one that precedes or foreshadows. It's one that conveys news or proclaims. It is one who actively promotes or advocates. I saw some preachers on the corner of West Street today. I saw some preachers on the corner. In fact, I saw, I don't know if these preachers have done it this way before, but today they had all four corners at the intersection of West Street and, is that 452? No, that's two, Route 2, right? Right by Double T Diner. All four. All four. Some sign said just a name. The name which is above every name. The name that no matter what your need is, you can call on that name. If you're sick, that's the name. If you're addicted, that's the name. If you're depressed, that's the name. If you're lost, that's the name. Somebody shout that name out. Go ahead, Brother Lewis. That's a preacher. Oh, I know what we think about a preacher is me and the person in this pulpit, but I don't think that's the context of what Paul is saying here. It's someone who will shout and proclaim. Maybe not necessarily. I mean, I don't think you need to be sitting in your office tomorrow yelling to the top of your lungs, but it's to proclaim. It's to declare. There's another sign that they hold up, and not only do they hold it up, but they shout it out to the cars that are sitting at the red light. Jesus loves you. How shall they hear without a herald? How shall they hear without somebody to proclaim glad tidings, somebody to let them know whatever it is you're going through, there is a God that is able. Whatever the problems are you're facing, I know somebody that's never faced faced a mountain that was bigger than he was. I know somebody that's never faced a problem that he could not solve. Jesus is the answer. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. It is to proclaim. Paul says, how shall they hear Without a preacher, again, it's not talking about somebody standing behind a pulpit. There's a time and a place for that. Right now is the time and the place. But the only preachers are not the ones that think they are called to preach. Every one of you in this place tonight that has the gift of the Holy Ghost, you are supposed to be a herald. You are supposed to be the declarer of good news. You are supposed to give the words of life and hope to somebody that wants to believe, needs to believe, but they don't know how to believe. They don't know who to believe in until somebody tells them. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse number 17. Oh, this first verse, what a verse. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. We live in a world that tells you whatever you were, you always are. 
If you were an alcoholic, you're always an alcoholic. If you were a drug addict, you're always a drug addict. If you were an adulterer, you're always an adulterer. That's the best the world has to offer. But can I tell somebody tonight, under the sound of my voice, there is a promise in this book that says if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away and all things have become new. Such were some of you, but you've been washed, you've been baptized, you've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, and whatever you were, you are not that anymore. I don't think what Paul's talking about here tonight is consignment shop new. Is this, is, uh, I know years ago it, there was one on Forest Drive. I think it may still be there, consignment shop called New to You. Still there. New to you. Through the years, especially the early years when we were really having to pinch pennies, my wife would come home. Sometimes I, I got the kids new clothes. First couple times she did that, I'd break out in sweat because uh, we ain't got money for new clothes. And then I started learning. When she said we got new clothes, she had been to Goodwill or some other consignment shop. It wasn't brand new. It was just new to us. Can I tell you what that verse, can you put that verse back on the screen, please? Can I tell you what that verse means when it says new? It's not new to you. It's not used car new. It's brand new. When you are baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, I know it may not make sense to a natural mind, but when you come up out of the waters of baptism, whatever you've done in your past is all under the blood, and you are a brand new creature. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. All things are become new. Let me just pause for a moment because let me just tell somebody, when, when you get baptized the way you, the way you are in Christ, the Bible says we are baptized into Christ. And when you are baptized, physically baptized, you're not going to come up out of that water as a perfect person. There's still going to be some flaws in your life. There's still going to be some weaknesses. So the question then becomes to me, is the scripture a lie? If it says you're a new creature, but you still see some old stuff about you. Absolutely the scripture doesn't lie. To me, what Paul is saying is God's confidence in what He can do in your life is so sure that He looks at what hasn't been done yet as if it's already done. Paul says He calls those things that are not, not as though they will be. He calls what hasn't happened yet that He plans to do as if it's already done. All things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us, hath given to us. Somebody say, that's me. He has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. He has given to us. He has given to you and I the ministry of reconciliation. Of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Oh. Somebody, you don't have a clue who you really are. Some of you might, but a bunch of you, you don't have a clue. You are an ambassador for Christ. As though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead... Be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin that we might be made the righteousness of God 
in him. I'm not going to re-preach this morning's message, but I read this morning two different places where Jesus said that he came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's his purpose, to find what was lost, to get back what was lost. And now you and I are in the place of the man Christ Jesus. And we are now the ones that pray in Christ's stead. Be ye reconciled to God. And now you and I are ambassadors for Christ. Listen to what Barnes Notes says about this idea of an ambassador. An ambassador is a minister of the highest rank, employed by one prince or state at the court of another to manage the concerns of his own prince or state and representing the dignity and power of his sovereign, sovereign, according to Webster. He is sent... Oh, Lord. Somebody, somebody's got to get this. He is sent, the ambassador is sent to do what the sovereign would do himself if he were present. You and I now do what Jesus Christ would do if he were here in the flesh. They are sent... To make known the will of the sovereign and to negotiate matters of commerce, of war, of peace, and in general everything affecting the interest of the sovereign among the people to whom they are sent. Paul says that you and I are ambassadors for Christ. At all times and in all countries, an ambassador is a sacred character and his person is regarded as inviolable. Oh, Lord. I, I, you, the devil has no right to touch you. The devil has no right. There's a thing called diplomatic immunity. Diplomatic immunity. That means where you are. If you're in a foreign country and you've got diplomatic immunity, that country has no authority over you. I don't know where you came from, but I didn't come from here. I was born again of another kingdom. I am now an ambassador representing another kingdom. And the enemy and the ruler of this world has no authority in my life or your life. Countries will establish an embassy in a nation where It's a foreign country for that nation. And the embassy, the embassy in a nation is sovereign land. Whatever the government, whatever the nation is, they have no authority. Uh, I wish I had a preaching church tonight. They have no, they're not allowed to go into that embassy. They have no right. You know what I believe we're sitting in tonight? I believe we're in an embassy. In fact, I'll tell you, I'm not going to tell you we don't ever fight the devil here. But it's a really rare thing to ever fight the devil here. Because we have established this as an embassy. And I'll tell you something else that I believe is an embassy. The place that I live is an embassy. And the enemy has no right in my house because I am an ambassador for Christ. At all times and in all countries, an ambassador is a sacred character and his person is regarded as inviolable. 
He is bound. Here's the here's the here's the challenge now. This is this is the hard part. He, the ambassador, is bound implicitly to obey the instructions of his sovereign. And as far as possible to do only what the sovereign would do were he himself present. We are in this world, but we are not of this world. My responsibility is to obey the instructions of the sovereign that sent me. And no matter what anybody around me does or does not do, that does not matter to me. Because I am not living under the laws of this land. I live under the laws of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And therefore I have a right to expect things from Him when I am living according to His will. Ministers are ambassadors for Christ as they are sent to do what He would do were He personally present. They are to make known and to explain and enforce the terms on which God is willing to be reconciled to people. They are not to negotiate on any new terms nor to change those which God has proposed, nor to follow their own plans or devices, but they are simply to urge, explain, state, and enforce the terms on which God is willing to be reconciled. You and I don't have the right to edit this book. You and I don't have the right to take things out of this book that are inconvenient and that we may not like. That is not our prerogative. It's not our right to change anything. It is our responsibility to communicate what the king has established. Of course, they are not to seek, of course, they are to seek the honor of the sovereign who has sent them forth and to seek to do only His will. They go not to promote their own welfare, not to seek honor, dignity, or emolument, but they go to transact the business which the Son of God would engage in were He again personally on the earth. It follows that their office is one of great dignity and great responsibility and that respect should be showed them as the ambassador of the King of Kings. We, you and I, are ambassadors for Christ. We speak on His behalf. But I'm pretty sure in the natural realm, if an ambassador is sent to a nation by their nation of origin, and they're going to another nation to represent their sovereign, if they don't act on the behalf of the sovereign, they're going to get called back home. They're not there to hide out. They're not there to to find a place of safety just to hide in. They are there to act on behalf of the nation that sent them. We spent about 12 months now doing a whole lot of hiding. We've spent about 12 months now with all kind of authority and power locked up in an embassy. But His purpose... His purpose is not for you just to hide out until He comes. His purpose is He came to seek and to save that which was lost. And so now you and I, more than ever before, need to engage in His purpose. His purpose. His purpose. Look at somebody next to you and tell them, you are a preacher. 
Tell somebody else, you are a preacher. You may never stand behind a pulpit. You may never stand on a platform. You, ne- you may never preach in a service, a conference, or whatever else it is, but you are a preacher. And how can they hear without a preacher? How can they know that Jesus is the answer for the world today? Above Him, there's no other. Jesus is the way. I don't care if you take the vaccine or don't take the vaccine. Somebody needs to know there's a healer. I don't care if you take the vaccine or don't take the vaccine. Somebody needs to know that there's a secret place that you can dwell in that the Most High will overshadow you and protect you. Somebody needs to know, but how are, they're not going to know it from Fox or CNN or MSNBC. They're not going to know it from Facebook or Instagram or any other source. I know some of you are trying to put it out there, but there's a whole lot of other junk out out there the way they're going to know it is by an ambassador who is representing Jesus Christ and praying in Christ's stead be ye reconciled I I hate to do this because I don't want to make anybody gun shy and, and you never share but as I said last Sunday night when I shared what brother Rafter sent me I do promise to never share anything of a personal nature Sister Yolanda Glass sent me an email this afternoon, testimony about how Engage is impacting her. She was in a job setting, circumstance where an individual was dealing with some physical issues. She said the Lord told her, tell them, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, tell them God's a healer. She initially Kind of thought, I can't do that, I'm on the job. But she finished up what she had to do, and she told him, God's a healer. Come to find out, a relative at church this morning, is that right, Sister Yon, at church this morning? A relative told him? I know, but the, the relative, didn't the relative say God was going to? Grandmother told him God was going to send a messenger. I'd like to introduce to you Ambassador Yolanda Glass. Oh, hallelujah. But look around. There's a whole lot of other ambassadors in this sanctuary right now. The question is not, are there more ambassadors? The question is, how many of us are acting as the ambassadors that we have been sent to be? I, I, I know, I know. Well, 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 what if I speak on behalf of the sovereign and he doesn't come through? You're not the sovereign. I, uh, I, 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 you know, I don't. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm usually slow to speak. There have only been a few times I've had to take back what I said. And a uh, couple of, couple of the kids have been coming up to me now for a couple of weeks. Pastor, you got candy? You got candy? Well, I do have candy, but it's been sitting in them jars since last March. I don't think I should be giving them a year old candy. So I, I've been telling them a couple of weeks now. I got to get candy. I gotta, I'm going to do my best to get candy. I'm going to do my best by Thursday. Come to me on a Thursday night. I'm going to do my best by Sunday night, to, uh, by Sunday to get candy. Two of them came up to me this morning. I tried to act like I didn't see them. <laughs> I knew what was coming. And they're slick, too. They come up, you know, hey, pastor, give me a little bump. Hey. They just kind of, pastor, yeah. Did you get that candy yet? No. And before I realized what I was saying, 
I said, you know what? You guys need to pray <laughs> that God would help me remember to get candy. They walked off, Nathaniel overheard what was going on. I don't remember what he said, but he was like, you really think you should have said that? Because if I don't get candy, they're now going to have trouble that God answers prayer. But I got good news. I got a bag of fresh lollipops in my office. Because it's nice to sit back and put it all on him. Yeah. But you know what? I did today what some of us need to recognize we're supposed to do. Not sit back. He wasn't going to miraculously provide the candy. I had to get engaged in the process. I had to do my part. And there's some people in this place tonight. God's got the resources. God's got the power. God's got the ability. He's just looking for some people to engage in His purpose and to speak on His behalf. And if there's ever been, there He goes running. He's one of the ones that prayed today. He's he's rejoicing. God. Except you be converted and become as little children. (laughs) Oh, yes. We pray you. We pray you in Christ's place. Be ye reconciled to God. Oh, it, it is my prayer, and I, and I may come back to this a little bit more here in a few minutes, but it's been my prayer the last day or so as we are heading into this week. There are some of you that I believe God wants, and some of you need, some of you want God to give you some more clear direction on the, on the specifics of your purpose. But let me tell you how, we, how God works a lot of times. God has a tendency to unfold things as we begin to engage. God doesn't usually sit down with us and tell us everything in detail in advance. In fact, if you haven't ever experienced this, I kind of hate to tell you, but oftentimes God throws you a bone just to get you moving. And then once you finally get moving, God says, okay, now that I got you moving, that's not really what I called you to. I just had to get you moving. Because an object at rest tends to stay at rest. But an object in motion tends to stay in motion. And an object in motion, can you can't steer a sitting car. You ever tried to sit in the parking lot and car on and turn the wheel? It's not e- when you're not moving, it's not easy to do. But when you're driving down the highway, all you need is one finger. Doesn't take a whole lot. Some of you are waiting on God to blow you up with dynamite to get you moving. God's waiting on you to get moving. And once you get moving, there's some things you never imagined that God had in store for you. There's some things God's planned for you that are exceeding abundantly above what you could ask or think. But God needs you to get moving. So... You don't need a, you may, you may in one sense need or want some specifics, but there's a purpose that applies to all of us. And that is God is trying to seek and to save that which is lost. There's your purpose. What more do you need? 
What more of a purpose do you need than to be looking around you seeing what it is in people's lives that is lost? That may be the sinner that's never known Jesus. That may be a brother or sister in Christ that already knows Jesus, but the enemy has stolen their peace. The enemy has stolen their joy. And you can be a part of God bringing back what was lost. Exodus 3, verse number 1. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. Don't forget the reason that Moses was here is because he had murdered an Egyptian and ran for his life. But now he's found a place of safety, security, He's now got a family. Things are going relatively well. And I think Moses was content to stay right there. I'm preaching to some people tonight. You've settled in to a place of safety. It may not be the most optimal place to be, but you found, some, you, you, you found a routine. I think that's what Moses had found. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God, when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called him called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. Listen to this next verse. The Lord says to Moses, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cries by reason of their taskmaster, for I know their sorrows. I've heard the pain, I've heard the cries of those that are afflicted. I've heard the brokenness of those in bondage. In verse 8 he says, I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppress them. Great God, well, go ahead and do something about it. That's awesome, God. You've heard the cries of the people that are afflicted. You've, you've heard the, the sighs of those that are in bondage. That's, that's awesome, God. So when are you going to do something about it? Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I've heard the cry of my people. I've seen the affliction that they are in, and I'm come down to deliver them, but I'm not going to do it by myself. I'm going to send you, Moses, to go. It's easy for us to sit back and say, God, well, you've heard the cries of this world and the lost and the dying souls, so go ahead and do something about it. And God's response is, I'm coming down to do something about it, but I need you to partner with me. I need you to go. I need you to participate in what it is I'm going to do. Moses responds and begins to argue with God. I I can't go, God. I'm not capable of that. 
He tells God, I, I can't go, God. I, I don't talk well. I, I'm slow of speech. You know, it's interesting. I forget the exact location, but in the book of Acts. Do you know what the Bible says about Moses in the book of Acts? He was eloquent. He had been an eloquent speaker at one point. God had to send him to the desert to get rid of the eloquence so that he would no longer rely on his own ability. Some of you have been in a wilderness for a little while and you don't understand why. I'll tell you why. You've got some talents and abilities that God's having to get you to stop relying on because when He gets done doing what He's going to do, there is no human being that's going to get the glory. There is no individual that's going to get the credit. All the glory, all the honor belongs to Him. And you are not the first person to try to convince God that you are unqualified. You know, we are some of the most egotistical people in all of the history of time. Some of you think you've got the first need God is never going to be able to solve. Some of you think you're dealing with the first situation that's going to stump God. You ain't that big. Some of you think you're the first one to be so disqualified, God can't use you. Just go read your Bible. Forget modern day where there's plenty of... Just go read your Bible. You want to talk about unqualified, undeserving people, that's the first people God always picks. So if you think you're going to discourage God from wanting to use you because you see all the reasons you're disqualified, I can see God just sitting up on the throne with His arms folded, tapping His foot. Okay, whenever you get out of breath and are tired of talking... Because you're not about to tell me something I haven't heard before. I'm slow of speech. So, there's Aaron. You see, whatever the issue is, God's got the answer. Paul says, for this thing I besought the Lord three times. And finally God responded and says, my grace is sufficient and my strength is made perfect in weakness. And Paul goes from begging God to take something out of his life to now rejoicing over what God put in his life. He said, now I'm going to rejoice in my weakness because it's in my weakness that he is now made strong. Do you not understand some of the greatest blessings you will ever face in your life do not initially look like blessings but they are the vehicle by which God has decided that he is going to use to manifest who he is in and through your life I've heard the cry I've come to this congregation tonight to tell you I believe God has heard the cry of some people in Anne Arundel County. I believe God has heard the cry of some people on the Eastern Shore. I believe God has heard the cry of some people in PG County. And I believe God is looking down in this sanctuary tonight at some Moseses. Some ambassadors. That you found a place of comfort and convenience. I said it this morning, I'm going to say it again tonight. One of the most miserable ways to live, especially as a believer, is to live focused on yourself. Because it is impossible for a disciple of Jesus Christ to live with peace and joy and happiness when you are the center of it all. The only way to live with joy in the kingdom as a child of God is to realize I am a conduit. Everything about me is to be a conduit for Him to flow through to touch somebody else, to minister to somebody else, to save somebody else, to heal somebody else, to deliver somebody else. And when you get your focus off of you, it's not going to be when everything gets in order it's not going to be when everything in your life is perfect in fact there will never be a day between now and death or the rapture in our lives where things are perfect God is always going to leave something to remind us it's not about us 
I, I, I'm not quite done. I don't think I'm done. But let's just, just, just a moment right here. Would somebody just talk to the Lord for a moment? I believe there's a sending spirit in this place tonight. I believe God is wanting to send some ambassadors afresh and anew to represent Him, to speak on His behalf, to speak with confidence and authority on His behalf, not to speak Hap, not to not to uh, 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 speak sheepishly on his behalf, not to speak with fear and intimidation on his behalf, but to declare with confidence as an ambassador representing him with the authority that he's giving you to speak. I remember what I read in the email from Sister Yolanda. She didn't tell them what God could do. She declared to them today what God would do. What, 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 what if I do that and God doesn't do it? What if you don't do it and God doesn't do it? And how will you know what He would have done unless you do what you're supposed to do? I heard Brother Cisco, Brother William Cisco say through the years, if you'll take the blame when God doesn't do something, You'll take the credit when he does do it. There is no place in this book that gives any approval to some kind of idea that there are certain special people. There's certain people, if they were here tonight, there's certain men of God, if they were here preaching tonight, some of you'd be sitting there with great expectation that God's going to heal you tonight because brother so-and-so is here. My Bible says these signs shall follow them that believe. It doesn't say these signs shall follow a special group of gifted people. It says these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, they're going to lay hands on the sick. They're going to cast out devil. There are every, there every Holy Ghost filled child in this place tonight has got enough authority to cause cancer to leave a body, to cause diabetes to leave, blind eyes to be open, deaf ears to be unstopped. It doesn't take some special person to do that. It just takes an ambassador that knows I have been sent by the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, and I'm acting on His behalf. In the name of Jesus, 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 in the name of Jesus. Jesus told the parable of the man that was going away and he took talents, distributed them. One man he gave five talents, another man he gave two, another one he gave one talent. He goes away and he comes back and asks for an, an account of what they had done and the guy that had five talents comes back and brings five more talents. He's now got ten talents. He commends him for what he has done. And then the next guy comes that he had given two talents with. He had taken those two talents and done something with them and turned them into four talents. And he commends him for what he's done. And then the guy that he had given one talent to comes and brings back one talent. And he got rebuked. But I want you to notice what he was rebuked for. Or notice what he was not rebuked for. He wasn't rebuked for not having the same return. He wasn't rebuked because he only had one talent and another guy had ten talents. He wasn't rebuked because he only one, had one talent and another guy now had four talents. That wasn't the rebuke. The rebuke was, you didn't do something with what I gave you. God is not sitting comparing you and I that we've all got to somehow come up with ten talents or four talents. All God is asking is I have invested something in you and I just need you to do something with what I've given you. You may not produce the same number of talents that somebody else. You, you may not produce the same return that somebody else produces, but that's not what you are expected to do. You just produce based on what he's given you 
Well, I can't sing like so and so. I can't preach like so. I can't pray like. I can't witness like. You don't have to. Just do what you're supposed to do. Be who God's called you to be. That's all He's asking of you. No place in Scripture where God asks us to be some other person. In fact, He wants us to be uniquely who He created us to be. I want to read this verse. And I think we're going to do more in a moment than just this, but in Acts 1 and 8, the Scripture says this. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. Why are you going to receive power? For your purpose. Yeah, and I said it this morning. Some of you in other places on Sunday morning. Sunday school started back up this morning. Our, 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 our theme is engage His presence, His purpose, and His power. Because engaging His power is not to be for our own selfish benefit. He says, I'm going, you shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you so that you can be a witness, so that you can engage in my purpose. You're going to be a witness unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. What he was telling them was, I'm giving you a responsibility to be an, a, a witness to your immediate circle of influence. I'm giving you a responsibility to be a witness to your family, be a witness to your neighbors, be a witness to your co-workers. I'm giving you a responsibility, that's Jerusalem. But then he says, I'm going to broaden that because I don't want you just being a witness in Jerusalem. I want you to go beyond Jerusalem and be a witness in Judea. But then I don't want you just to go to Judea, I want you to go beyond that to Samaria. And then Samaria is not enough, I want you to go to the uttermost part of the earth. You understand you and I don't sit here tonight with just the responsibility of reaching Annapolis. We're not here tonight with just the responsibility of reaching Annapolis and Arnold and Severna Park. We're not here tonight with just the responsibility of reaching and impacting Anne Arundel County. We're here tonight to impact Maryland. And we're not here tonight just to impact Maryland. We're here tonight to impact the East Coast. I was told by a man of God a couple of years ago, this was to me directly, not, this is not one of the other promises that came in the past, but he said to me about us, you, your church is important to the East Coast. I didn't ask for that, I didn't come up with that, that's what I was told, but we're not just here to impact the East Coast, we're here to impact the United States. We're not just here to impact the United States. We're here to impact the uttermost parts of the earth. And there's different ways that that happens. Sometimes that happens through people like Ted Grossbach, who goes to Africa for 30 years. Sometimes that happens through people like John Hemus, who's now been in Liverpool for 20 years. Sometimes that happens through people that go to other places. But some of us are not called to go to the uttermost parts. But that does not relieve us from a responsibility to help impact reaching the uttermost parts. This church has been built on a commitment to giving to missions to help reach the world. Brother Benner, I think it's safe to say that several million dollars in the history of this church has been given away to missions. No direct benefit, but because you and I are supposed to engage in His purpose. You and I are supposed to be engaged in His purpose by reaching Jerusalem and those that are around us, those that we are connected to. But then some way or another, whether that's by going or that's by our giving, we are supposed to engage in His purpose and impacting the world. There are people in this place tonight that have given faithfully to missions for decades. 
And some of you have yet to really do that, and I've come to encourage you and challenge you tonight to get involved in the kingdom, His purpose. You don't have to raise a hand. I'm not asking you to raise a hand, but how many of you have a financial need tonight? I'm not looking for hands. How many of you have a fi- how many of you have financial needs in your life? Let me tell you one way God provides financial needs. Not by you storing up everything to meet the need, but by you becoming a conduit through which he can meet the need. And in the midst of him using you to meet another need, you get blessed in the process. I've watched people for years and years that had needs and didn't have the resources, but they made up their mind they were going to sow into the kingdom of God. They were going to give to the kingdom to impact the kingdom. And next thing you know, there's things that begin to open up in their lives that were unexpected. Raises on jobs and and other blessings that have come because they've made up their mind, I'm going to be engaged in His purpose. I'm just going to, in addition to the other giving you should be doing, your tithes that the Scripture teaches, that we should be faithful with our tithing and other giving, I'm going to tell you tonight, if you are in this place and you're an adult, first and foremost, but even beyond that, if you're a young person and you got a job, I believe that every single person ought to be sowing on a regular basis into missions. There's something about sowing in a place that you get no direct benefit from. I mean, what we did tonight, giving, committing to give money for these masks, that's wonderful, but there's direct benefit right here, right now. But when you give something that you know, there is no direct benefit that you're giving out of that except for the fact that whatever you sow, the Bible says you will reap, and you can't outgive God. And the problem is this, though, if you sow sparingly, you reap sparingly. But if you sow abundantly, you reap abundantly. And let me just be clear really quickly for those of you that may be misunderstanding. I'm not here tonight preaching about prosperity and getting rich. There's a lot of things way more important than you getting rich. And you know what? In the natural, when you sow a seed, the only thing you reap is that seed. In the natural, you don't sow an orange seed and reap an apple tree. You don't sow peas and get broccoli. You get what you sow. But I am of the opinion, and I believe I have experienced, that when it comes to things in the kingdom, you don't necessarily always reap what you sowed. But you reap. What I mean by that is, I haven't always seen God give back immediately or in a recognizable way the the money that I gave. But I've seen God give me a healthy household. I've seen God give me a family that's living in peace. I've seen God give me relatives and relationships that are healthy and strong. And I don't know about you, I'd take all that over a bunch of money any day. I'd rather have a household with a wife and kids that are healthy and going to heaven than I would to have a couple of million in the bank with kids that are on their way to heaven. I'm not here preaching to you. This is not about get rich quick. This is not about sowing your thousand dollar seed offering. This is about the fact that God has a heartbeat to seek and save that which was lost. And again, we have a responsibility in Jerusalem. We've got a responsibility in Judea and then in Samaria, and then beyond that, to impact the world. People that you'll never meet in this life. People that you'll never encounter in this life. But people that your participation in the purpose of God is going to impact their lives. I know half of you probably don't have a pen because we don't carry pens anymore. 
But I'm asking you, if you already are given to missions, you're already given faithfully, I'm asking you to put down what you're giving. I'm asking everybody in this place tonight to make some, don't, don't, I'm not talking about something that you have no intention. I don't care if it's a dollar. Jesus was standing with his disciples one day and these rich guys were coming and dropping in their big offerings. The disciples were sitting there with their jaws hanging down, impressed by how much they were giving probably nudging each other every now and then when a really big offering was given. Big eyes. Jesus recognized what was going on, and in the midst of all that, there comes a little woman with a, with a dollar. They're giving hundreds and hundreds of dollars, and she comes by, and she's got a dollar, and she drops it in, and he turns to them, and he says, She has just given more than them. Because they have given out of their abundance. They've given out of what was extra. But she has given out of her necessity. So it's not the dollar amount that matters to God. Don't be in, if all you can afford to give is a dollar, give a dollar. The point is, give something of yourself to get beyond our borders. To go, to reach. How many of you have ever traveled on some kind of ministry related? Not, I know a bunch of you have been on business and work and military, but how many of you here have ever traveled on some kind of ministry related trip to a foreign country? Would you raise a hand? That, 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 I'd say that's about a third or so of this congregation. And the rest of you, some of you may end up going. Crazy as the world is now, I'm pretty happy just to stay right here. But you know what? There'll be those that never go. But we're given the impact or the opportunity to impact the world from right here. I believe in 2021, God has heard the cry of people. I believe in 2021, God has seen the affliction and the brokenness of lives. People that He wants to touch, people He wants to impact, but how shall they believe in something they have not heard of? How shall they hear if no one proclaims? I realize some of you may not be comfortable doing it this way, and I respect that. You do whatever you're comfortable with, and that's perfectly fine. I want you to stand. I'm going to ask everyone that would this evening. If you've already filled out your paper and you do what I'm about to ask you to do, you can just come and put it on the platform. If not... There's, a, there's a, probably a basket in the back. You could just drop it in there. But I, I want to make an appeal right now. As we head into this week of engaging His purpose, if you're in this place tonight, and the way you feel is, God, I want to be engaged in Your purpose. I want to be a participant in Your purpose purpose. Would you just make your way down to this front, to this altar area? You can kneel. You can stand. I don't really care how you do it. That's fine either way. Would you just come as an act of presenting yourself to Him tonight to say, Lord, I want to engage in Your purpose. I hope you've experienced what I've experienced this past week, the joy of engaging in His presence. Oh, how sweet it is to be engaged in His presence. What a wonderful thing it is to be engaged in His presence. But the purpose of engaging in His presence is so that we can then go and participate in His purpose. The reason for engaging in His presence is not just for our own personal 
benefit. It's not for our own personal pleasure and enjoyment. Of course, we get things out of it. Obviously, we're benefited by engaging in His presence, but we engage in His presence so that we can then go and engage in His purpose. I know there's some of you tonight that you're already engaged you're already engaged in his purpose. So would you just take a few moments tonight to just commit again? God, I'm already engaged, but I want you to know I'm going to stay engaged in your purpose. I'm going to stay active. I'm going to continue to be a participant with your purpose. But then I think there's some people tonight that if you were to be honest, you would have to say, I haven't really been all that engaged in his purpose. I haven't really been all that connected to his purpose. But God, tonight I'm presenting myself. I'm giving myself away tonight so that you can use me, so that I can be a part of your purpose, God. In the name of Jesus, Father, tonight we stand before you as a congregation, individually, but also as a congregation. We want to be engaged in your purpose. We don't want to be caught up in our purposes, God. We don't want to be caught up with our agenda, our desires. But God, we want to be fully engaged in your purpose of seeking and saving that which was lost, of seeing the captive set free, of seeing the brokenhearted delivered, healed, of seeing those that are bound find liberty and freedom, of seeing those that have ashes making an exchange for beauty, those that have been burdened down with the garment of heaviness to receive the garment of praise, those that have the oil of mourning to receive gladness and joy, God. Your purpose your purpose your purpose your purpose God I don't want to live for my purpose I don't want to live for my purpose God I want to live for your purpose I don't want to live focused on my purpose God I want to live focused on your purpose I don't want to live my life motivated by my purpose I want to live my life motivated by your purpose In the name of Jesus. Come on, this is what Paul was talking about. Present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God as your reasonable service. It's reasonable for us to be engaged in His purpose. It's reasonable for us to be engaged in His mission. It's reasonable for us to be actively involved in His heartbeat. His desires. Lord, send a We want to be engaged in your purpose in this area. We want to be engaged in your purpose in this county. We want to be engaged in your purpose in this state. We want to be engaged in your purpose on the East Coast. We want to be engaged in your purpose in this nation. We want to be engaged in your purpose beyond this nation, God. Whether that's by those amongst us physically going or if it's by us providing some of the resources, some of the finances for those that are sent to go. We want to be fully engaged in your purpose. Oh God, there's somebody that's waiting on a preacher. There's somebody that's waiting on a preacher. Not a preacher in a pulpit, but a preacher in a living room. Not a preacher in a pulpit, but a preacher in the office. Not a preacher in the sanctuary, but a preacher on the street corner, a preacher in the restaurant, a preacher in the hospital, somebody that'll declare good news anywhere, anytime. In the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus. 
Mahala Moko Shata Yanda Ramaha. If you feel led to pray with someone else, you're welcome to do that. If you feel led to let the Lord use you to minister to someone, that's fine. If you need to continue to pray for yourself, that's fine as well. Oh, if you've got a question or doubt tonight, if God has a purpose for you, why don't you let God confirm to you? Oh, he may not tell you the details of it tonight, but he can confirm to you tonight that he's got a purpose for you. He's got a purpose for your life. He's got a mission designed for you. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, pour it out, God. We want it. We're ready for it, God. We're hungry for it. Send revival. Send laborers into the harvest. Send revival, God, to renew and revive us. And send laborers forth, God, to recover that which was lost, to take back that which the enemy has stolen in the name of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Pour it over my city. Oh, God, we want you to pour out your spirit. We want you to pour out your spirit, God. We're positioning ourselves. We're making ourselves available. We're getting ourselves ready, God. Work through us. Work in us and work through us, God. Oh, yes, God. Pour it over our neighborhoods. Pour it out in our communities. Pour it out on our jobs. Pour it out in our schools. Pour it out, God, in our families, Lord, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Revive, renew, restore, God, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. We're ready. We're ready. Oh, yes, God. Yes, God. Yes, God. We're ready. We're available. We're available, we're available, we're available, God. We're available to you, God. We're available to you, God. lost loved ones tonight, why don't you tell him this right now? You've got backsliders in your family. If you've got people in your family that have never been saved, why don't you cry out to him right now, God, pour it out. And I want you not just to pour it out, but pour it out through me, God. Let me be the vessel that you use. Let me be the conduit that you flow through, God, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Pour it over my family. Pour it over my Oh, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Pour it over my sin. Pour it over my family. Pour it over
if you need to go, you're welcome to go, but the Holy Ghost is still doing something in this sanctuary. If you need to go, that's fine. You're welcome to go when you're ready. But there's some things God's doing still in this sanctuary right now. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Oh, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. you God oh yes Lord yes Lord oh here we are available and ready and willing God pour it out pour it out pour it out Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. I will keep fast. We believe God. We believe it's coming. We believe you're going to do it. We believe you're going to do it, God. We believe you're going to do it, God. We expect it. We've got confidence. We've got faith. You're going to do it. We're not going anywhere, God. We are engaging afresh and anew in the work and the move of your spirit, God. I pray, God, that you would send preachers forth from this place tonight, God. Let preachers, declarers of the good news, be sent forth from this place tonight, God. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We're ready. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Harabaka sataye aramanda. Hey, aramando lo boko reye aramando roboko satana. In the name of Jesus. 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 Haya Ramaka Sato Roboko Sataya. Yala Ramando Roboko Yala. In Jesus' name. 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 